in our uh, overheating world, um, two years ago, Bill Strever, who is a biologist based in Alaska, wrote a book all about cold and um, its influence on our planet and uh, our history. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. Stories of Arctic explorers, uh, the thermal qualities of blubber, um, and the scientific uh, quest for absolute zero. But uh, reviewing it for the, um, for the New York Times, Mary Roach wrote, well, to understand cold is to understand the world. And this is true, actually. I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're here in a landscape shaped by glaciers here in New York. Um, we can all think of a million of exa examples of where climate has shaped human, plant, um, animal behavior patterns, migration, and hence those in turn have shaped the globe. What I started to wonder about, and it was partly because the review was illustrated by this picture of a fridge, was what about artificial cold? What about that entire man-made winter of mechanized refrigeration, um, a technology that rose to dominance in the, in the 20th century? And um, so my argument for you is to understand uh, artificial refrigeration is to understand the world, or at least the world that we have built. So, um, at some point in its life, every slice, uh, squeeze, or bite of Kraft cheese um, spends some time in this vast underground refrigerated warehouse in Missouri, in this photo by uh, Christoph Morlinghaus for Wired. And um, it's kind of an industrial uh, cheese cave, if you will. <laughs> and, but as, as sort of impressive as this site is, it's just the tip of a vast global network of refrigerated warehouses and spaces. And, and so I became literally fascinated at these kind of hidden spaces, where they are, you know, what they look like. And so I have, uh, what I very quickly discovered is that um, no one has really mapped that, actually. Um, in the US, which is the first and the most refrigerated nation on Earth, um, <laughs> there isn't... The, the form, the geography, the distribution, the types of these refrigerated spaces is really a big question mark. The USDA does maintain a census, a monthly census of, of cold stored foods, but it's actually only for foods that have been in cold storage for 30 days or more, which in our just-in-time um, economy is, um, and here we go, it's the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> so... <laughs> so um, I set out to, to understand the landscape of refrigeration, or what I call the artificial cryosphere. And, um, and I've been doing, I've been collecting data, I've been interviewing experts, I've been reading uh, industry journals, uh, Refrigeration and Frozen Foods Monthly. Um, and <laughs> more interesting than you'd think. And, and what I'm doing with all of this research is I'm curating it into an exhibition um, called the Artificial Cryosphere, opening later this year at a place called the Center for Land Use Interpretation, which for those of you that don't know it, immediately uh, go home, even you could skip the rest of my talk and check it out now if you have your phones. It's an excellent um, organization that sort of looks at various landscapes um, as sort of cultural inscriptions and reads them for what they tell us about who we are and what we do. So they look at oilscapes or tourism scapes, and, and they just kind of mine them for clues about us and how we choose to use our landscape. So for them, I'm exploring the landscape of, uh, of artificial refrigeration. Um, I've also been teaching a research seminar on this up at Columbia University um, with my architecture students, and there we've been looking a little at, at the history and evolution of refrigerated spaces too. So uh, it's both to kind of understand the system, how we arrived at the system we have now, and also to mine some of the ideas that got discarded or roads not taken along the way to see if they have any design potential for the future. So what you're looking at here, a couple of examples there, um, top right, a uh, um, under street refrigeration system that was installed in the 1890s in uh, Quincy Market in Boston, sort of the idea was that refrigeration would be something like gas and electricity that would come with a pipe, through a pipeline to your house. Um, and on the bottom left, one, a thing that's interesting there is that um, refrigerated warehouses used to look like banks or city buildings. They used to be built by famous architects. And, uh, and the reason for that was that people didn't trust cold stored foods. Uh, how would they know that they were really fresh? 
which is a, actually a good question. Um, but so people hired, you know, a big name architects to build impressive buildings. Of course, now refrigerated warehouses are for the most part totally invisible, um, so as not to interfere with the picture of the farm that we picture in our minds when we're buying our refrigerated products, which doesn't really exist, people. But anyway. <laughs> So I've been studying the cryosphere at a variety of scales, is the other thing. I've talked about warehouses already, but of course the, the cryosphere exists at the retail scale too. And one thing that's interesting is that when the, uh, when the self-service concept in supermarkets was introduced in 1916, there were three industries that supported it. The shopping cart makers, uh, DuPont, and the early kind of makers of kind of early iterations of cellophane and things like that, and the refrigeration industry, because they could see the huge, huge retail and the domestic market that this would unlock. And um, of course, the coming of the supermarket and, and the car and the domestic refrigerator and the supermarket refrigerator together have completely changed the landscape of America. And you go from shopping daily, high streets and whatnot, to you know these out of town mega balls and, and the rest of it. They also completely changed our diet. And I think it's interesting that uh, refrigeration, which kind of detaches food from both uh, time and space, so season and you know producer and consumer, those are the two main trajectories that our food system has taken in the 20th century, you know, alongside the rise of refrigeration. So, following the food from the uh, supermarket to the domestic refrigerator, and I should say that neither of these is mine. Um, <laughs> In fact, they're uh, part of a series by a photographer called Mark Menjavar, who uses them as kind of portraits almost um, for a series called You Are What You Eat. Um, but yeah, the, the domestic refrigerator also, again, sort of full of interesting stories, including things that you might not have uh, thought about. Um, the classic story of why, how the refrigerator got, it, got its hum. Um, you know, how it, it's basically a story of how the electric refrigerator beat the gas refrigerator, which at the time was actually A, silent, and B, much more efficient. Um, but the electric refrigerator kind of won that war, but like kind of VHS and Betamax in the day. And, um, and so the electric refrigerator won, and what that meant is that our domestic soundscape for the next, you know, ongoing 100 years until they figured out how to make quiet motors had a tiny hum embedded in it. Um, it also, of course, reshaped domestic space. And in addition to its spatial footprint, it had a very interesting and slightly more subtle cultural footprint. So as it replaced the places where we would traditionally store food, like a root cellar, for example, and that says the Parthenon of root cellars, but, uh, but as it replaced those physical spaces, it also replaced the cultural knowledge that was embedded in them. So the the, the, the idea that root vegetables might li like to live in a cool, damp environment because that's where they come from. And the, the, the vegetables are sort of respiring organic things. Um, these are designs uh, by a uh, South Korean designer called ji Yun Ryu, who um, coincidentally is speaking at a TEDx event in Europe today as well, so she's probably showing these somewhere else. Um, but they, they're called Save Food from the Refrigerator, and they're kind of a proposal for what happens when you start thinking of food as an as a organic, respiring, decaying object, um, and you don't put it in a box to do all of that. You kind of put it in an environment to do that. Um, so as well as uh, the domestic refrigerator and the retail, obviously refrigeration changed the landscape of production. And the, the time that this really became huge is when mobile refrigeration started happening. Meat was the first um, food to be transported in refrigerated containers because it's such a high value commodity. And what that did is, um, well, I mean, it had a huge, it changed everything basically. It, it uh, reshaped an entire economic and production um, geography from the consolidation of the Chicago stockyards to the four to five companies that control our meat supply today. Um, it also changed our diets, and economies of scale meant that we increased our, the amount of meat we ate, and of course you, now economies of scale also mean that you need to use all the byproducts, so you get what I like to call food analogs, which are things like stearine and margarine and all the byproducts that we use up. It's the same story with bananas. Banana, uh, refrigeration makes a huge difference here. In 1899, bananas are so rare that Scientific American has to print instructions on how to eat them. Um, <laughs> For real. In 1914, they're so common that several small towns that in, and cities even had enacted legislation banning you from dropping your banana peel due to an epidemic of falls and slips. 
no joke also. Um, what had happened in between was United Fruit introducing their Great White Fleet, um, which is a refrigerated steamships. Um, the other impact of that, of course, is decades of civil war and military dictatorships in um, Central America. But you also get this curious byproduct, um, the banana ripening rooms, which is an interesting refrigerated space. This is an example that I, uh, I recently visited up in the Bronx, where there are 22 um, atmosphere-controlled pressurized rooms. Um, um, and 800,000 pounds of bananas are subjected to a, a thermal control regime over a week to um, kind of wake them up after their refrigerated journey and, and make them believe that they're back on the tree in Ecuador again. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> in any case, um, so we have uh, trains and uh, trucks, but mobile refrigeration and, and ships, mobile refrigeration also s uh, spread to planes. Uh, in 1971, Japan Airlines introduced the Envirotainer, and, um, and uh, you could trace almost directly from that the rise of sushi and the corresponding decline of bluefin tuna. So, and, and then, of course, in the 80s, when microprocessors start becoming cheap and, and more available, you start getting um, refrigerated containers. And these, like all refrigerated spaces, didn't actually work that well at first, and I had a really fascinating conversation with a woman who had spent a decade traveling around in them trying to figure out why the blueberries from Chile and the lamb from New Zealand wasn't arriving in per perfect shape. Um, and she's now a small heirloom apple farmer in New York, which is an interesting career choice. <laughs> but, but in any case, this changes everything. And now you get a situation where our food supply is global. Frequently, the item on your plate is better traveled than you are. You get salmon that is caught off the coast of Canada, shipped to Guangzhou in one of these um, to be de-pinboned and shipped straight back as fresh, never frozen. Um, we have a special name for human refrigeration. It's called air conditioning. <laughs> and this is the topic of a, uh, an exhibition of it, uh, in and of itself. So it's not in my exhibition. Fortunately, the National Building Museum in DC already did this. But um, uh, without it, we wouldn't have skyscrapers, uh, summer blockbusters, sunbelt cities, or a whole variety of other things. Um, and then finally, there are strange kind of uh, curiosities and weird fringes of refrigeration. So this is one of my favorites. This is a, uh, a, uh, the largest climate testing laboratory in the world. The US um, Air Force uses it to test mechanical elements under extreme cold conditions. Obviously, it's in Florida which you can <laughs> tell. <laughs> and, um, and not to be outdone, the US Army maintains a two kilometer long permafrost tunnel under artificial refrigeration as well. You have the wacky, wacky fringes, which is liposuction banking, and my favorite, the human cryonics movement. That's an amazing photo by Taryn Sim Simon of, uh, from the Atlas of Hidden um, and Unexplored Places. And then my favorite example is um, the National Ice Core Laboratory in Denver, where we're maintaining a uh, record of previous climates, which we are now replacing with a climate of our own, in part because of all the energy we spend keeping places cold. So thank you for joining me on this whistle-stop tour of the artificial cryosphere. Um, you can find out more about it at the exhibition when it opens later this year, also my ongoing research on my blog. And, um, and hopefully I've given you something to think about next time you open your fridge. <laughs>